I was a graduate of the University of Cambridge in England and there I studied under some of the leaders of Keynesian thought. In fact, I didn't study under anybody who didn't believe in Keynesian thought between 1951 and 1954 at Cambridge. And my uh, supervisors there were uh, Joan Robinson, who was a um, neo-communist. Um, <laughs> good friend of Rosa Luxemburg, the well-known conservative thinker. Um, Nicky Caldor was another supervisor of mine, subsequently went on to become economic advisor to the Wilson Labor government and uh, managed to advise them as to how to put a few more coffins into the uh, economy of the uh, British Isles. I was also supervised by Richard Kahn, who invented the multiplier theory for Keynes. And Richard Goodwin, an American economist, was on the lamb from the McCarthy Committee. <laughs> so um, it was not until very late in life that the uh, names of Friedrich A. von Hayek and Ludwig von Mises uh, had much of an impact on my thought. And I didn't find out about them in books. I found out about them through bitter experience working as a journalist in a modern economy and uh, presenting myself as an opponent of government intervention in the economic life of my native land, Australia. That country uh, suffers from um, a long tradition of protectionist economic policies and government uh, intervention on a grand scale. And my criticisms of the government in the 1960s made them so furious that um, they raided my house with uh, 14 police, uh, tried to have me um, incarcerated, uh, and fortunately I was managed to uh, sue the Commonwealth Government of Australia uh, for uh, having invaded my premises with an illegal warrant and won what became a landmark uh, victory for uh, personal freedom uh, in Australia. So I know from uh, personal experience that governments get very nasty uh, when you uh, try to stop them uh, pushing you around. And really, through a long experience of dealing with bureaucrats and politicians in my life as a journalist over 25 years, I found out in a very practical way how valid are the views of people like von Hayek and uh, von Mises. I quote, I was reading the uh, little booklet that was given out today with the uh, papers for this conference and I have this quote here from von Hayek where he said, sometimes I have feared that liberty is only valued when it is lost. And I can tell you, when the police are knocking on the door, freedom becomes very, very valuable. And uh, so I think that there must be a lot of other people like myself who were brought up in an, in, uh, an ingrained tradition of Keynesian thought and who found out about people like von Hayek, von Mises, and also Milton Friedman through uh, one's life experience of finding out what governments are capable of doing and what central banks are capable of doing. And there is no greater example of the damage to personal freedom, to economic freedom and to economic stability than what we have seen in the last 15 years in this country, where there has been a social revolution in the United States. It was called the Great Society. As a result of this revolution, a new class of Americans was created, a class of almost 65 million dependent Americans. Adding the number of gov civilian government employees to this total, we reach a grand total of just short of 79 million Americans today who live on a government check. 
The number of non-government civilian employees in this country is approximately 83 million. So we have now reached the astounding situation in America where the number of non-government workers is approximately equal to the number of government employees and other dependent Americans, one for one. This revolution has been largely accomplished in the last 20 years and the most virulent revolutionary phase has occurred in the last 15 years. Let me summarise a few numbers with which you're all no doubt familiar. In the 23 years between 1960 and 1983, total government outlays, federal, state and local in this country, rose to eight and a half times their 1960 level. Over the same period, gross national product less government outlays rose about five times. So in the broad, government outlays have risen almost twice as fast as non-government part of gross national product. The rate of advance of government outlays accelerated mightily during the 1970s. Five years ended 65, 34% increase. Five years ended 70, 68%. Five years ended 75, 63%. Five years ended 1980, 80% increase in government outlays in five years. The driving force in this fantastic explosion of government outlays was federal transfer payments. Between 1964 and 1983, 19 years, total federal government outlays rose nearly six times, but federal transfer payments rose over 11 times. Excluding transfer payments, federal outlays rose only three and three quarter times. In order to finance this unprecedented change in the nature of the allocation of after-tax incomes in the United States, it was necessary to resort to inflationary finance. It was necessary because the taxpayers of the United States would not countenance increases in rates of taxation uh, sufficient to finance this tremendous change in the nature of American society without uh, inflation. The age of inflation was the result of an attempt to bring about a social revolution in the United States against the will of the taxpayers of the United States. Two main uh, sources of resources were found to affect uh, this revolution. The first was Bracket Creep, which allowed major unlegislated increases in the rates of taxation to occur. And the second was a confiscation of wealth in the form of financial assets. To give you a couple of examples, the Dow Jones Bond Index in terms of 1977 prices fell by more than one half between January 77, when Jimmy Carter came to power, and January 81, when Ronald Reagan came to power. Between 1975 and 1983, the real value of the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell by about one quarter. There was a major confiscation of wealth in the form of financial assets. That and bracket creep were the two means used to uh, make an obligatory change in the uh, allocation of incomes and uh, wealth in this country. Between 1965 and 1980, the proportion of gross national product absorbed by federal government transfer payments rose from 4.5% to 13%. Between 1960 and 1980, the number of dependent Americans and government employees rose from 37.9 million to 78.9 million. There were 40 million more dependent Americans and government employees in 1980 than there were in 1960. I would call that um, a socialist revolution in a so-called free country. In all these revolutionary changes involving confiscation of wealth, hidden taxes on income, and the creation of a new class of dependent Americans, the central bank, Federal Reserve, played a vitally important role. Without the active cooperation of the central bank in fostering inflation, 
this social revolution could not have occurred. It could not have occurred because without the veil of inflation, the stark reality of the diversion of wealth and income to a new class of dependent Americans would not have been supportable. It could only be achieved by stealth. The need to raise taxation by overt legislative action involving large increases in rates of taxation would have, proved Im would have imposed impossible strains on the political process. For most of the last 15 years, the Federal Reserve has been able to hide its actual intentions by adopting a policy of so-called interest rate targeting. The Federal Reserve was able to suggest its good intentions by presenting its policy target as that of holding down interest rates during a period of endemic inflation. Rather than follow the path of monetary aggregate targeting, the central bank adopted the policy of interest rate targeting. This meant, in effect, that the Federal Reserve maintained a permanent policy posture of accommodation of cash. The accommodative stance of the Federal Reserve became most overt under Arthur Burns, who cooperated intimately with President Nixon in providing strong increases in liquid funds. The Burns policy led to a strong expansion of money during 1970-73 and during 1976-79. The need for urgent provision of superabundant money during the run-up to the 1972 and 1976 elections dominated Burns' policy requirements. Paul Volcker provided another huge burst of liquid funds for the run-up to the 1980 elections. During the whole of the period of the 1970s, the Federal Reserve fought tooth and nail against a formal system of monetary targeting. It's not surprising that this should have been so. The Federal Reserve was intimately involved in the political process of social revolution in the 1970s. Burns and G. William Miller were both deeply committed to the presidents they served, Nixon and Ford and Volcker, is a lifetime bureaucrat who wants to please his bosses. As an aside, it may, it may seem strange to you uh, as you look at all the various different uh, uh, M's that we have these days. We've got M1, M2, M3, we've got L, we've got all sorts of funny things, MQ. Now, the reason for the invention of these M's was an attempt by the Federal Reserve to pull the wool over the eyes of those, notably the Congress, who wanted to impose a system of monetary uh, targeting. In 19, March 1975, as you're all very well aware, the, uh, there was a, a, a resolution passed called House Concurrent Resolution Number 133, which required the Federal Reserve to set up annual monetary targets and to abide by those targets. Well, the Federal Reserve uh, officials got around that in two ways. One, they invented a diversity of targets so that at any given time they could say, well, we hit that one. Uh, and then they proceeded to change the uh, base period uh, First of all, they did it every quarter, then they did it every six months, then they did it every year, and now they do it every now and again when it's convenient. And we had one of those just recently. <coughs> so uh, the Federal Reserve officials have used their talents, their um, knowledge, and their, um, their will to evade any attempt by Congress to require them to uh, have what would be described as a reasonably responsible uh, monetary policy which can be judged by objective criteria. The effects of the policy of inflationary finance in the United States were felt worldwide. An important part of the policy of enforced transfers of resources and income inside America was the need to depreciate the American currency in its international aspect. 
Between 1971 and 1980, the trade weighted value of the United States dollar fell from about 125 to about 85, a decline of about 30% in the relative value of the world's most important currency. The effect of this huge depreciation of the US dollar was to spread the inflationary incubus throughout the world financial system. In this way, the foundations were laid for the current crisis of the debts of the LDC countries. I believe that that crisis originated from the failures of domestic United States policy. Due to the policies of the Federal Reserve in administering and reinforcing the New Deal controls over interest rates and the financial markets generally in the United States, it was less and less open to the American banks to make profitable loans inside the United States. Hence, they were obliged to expand their operations internationally. After all, in 1978, by which time the price level in this country had doubled uh, since 1968, uh, ten, five year treasury bonds were still showing a nominal yield of 7%, and people were still getting a 5.25% nominal yield on passbook savings. They were being robbed. And so when uh, the American banks experienced uh, a huge flood of uh, deposits from overseas, naturally they weren't going to lend that out at some ridiculous rate of interest inside this country. And so they went around the world trying to find places where they could lend it. And they lent it to these uh, so-called sovereign debtors, including a major financing of the communist system in Eastern Europe. The communists were prepared to pay a realistic rate of interest, but they weren't allowed to uh, get that rate inside this country. Hence, they were, this meant an extraordinary expansion of lending to countries which were prepared to pay going market rates for loans. The Federal Reserve administered a structure of controls over interest rates typified by Regulation Q interest rate controls. These interest rate controls in an environment of spiralling inflation were, of course, part and parcel of the policy of attempting to hide the true costs of inflation. And these true costs were hidden by manipulating interest rates, the effect of which was to rob depositors and lenders of their wealth. In the process, the Federal Reserve almost succeeded in bankrupting the entire savings and loan and savings bank industry in this country. The, 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 the bankruptcy of those industries was avoided only by a hair's breadth, 1981. It was the Federal Reserve controls over domestic interest rates inside the United States that stimulated the flood of US bank loans to LDC countries. Consequently, I believe that one additional uh, result of Federal Reserve, uh, United States Federal Reserve policy during the 1970s was to set up LDC countries for bankruptcy. And those countries now are going through a tremendously painful process of adjustment, which will take them some years. They were, in effect, like um, borrowers who suddenly find that uh, they've got limited, unlimited access to easy money. They went on a, a spree, quite understandable. The money was being pushed down their throats. Uh, there was no possibility of them being able to repay that money, nor is there any possibility of it. The 300 billion uh, of uh, those LDC loans are not repayable and will not be repayable for years, if ever. Uh, however, uh, due to the efforts of governments in these LDC countries, and we can already see how the Mexicans and the Brazilians uh, are imposing tremendous uh, uh, self-sacrifice on their own people, huge reductions in imports, uh, disastrous developments like the nationalisation of the Mexican banking system, imposition of import controls and socialisation of the whole foreign exchange sector in Brazil. In all of these ways, 
United States policy has contributed to an economic disaster and a social and political disaster throughout Latin America and also in many East European countries. The Europe, East European countries perhaps deserve it, they're communists, they deserve whatever they get, but uh, the other people are supposed to be our friends. Fortunately, there is a ray of hope due to the uh, operation of free markets in uh, money in the United States. As the 1970s wore on, interest rates started to rise as the money illusion lifted. For years, the American financial markets suffered from a money illusion. As I said, by 1978, you were still uh, only getting 7% on a 10-year US bond. Uh, but between 1978 and 1981, this money illusion uh, just lifted and um, stark reality started to uh, uh, impose itself on the thinking of the financial markets who had gone on for 10 years during a period of doubling of the price level in the United States without any significant rise in interest rates at all. It took that long for the money illusion to lift. Anyway, as the money illusion lifted, the participants in the financial markets in the United States came to realise the full extent of the disaster that was occurring. Attempts to protect themselves were initiated by lenders. It's astonishing how long it took the financial markets to wake up. The most important development aimed at mitigating the rate of wealth holders was the development of the money market mutual funds. That was a tremendously important development which began the counterattack by the financial markets against the uh, destruction that was being imposed upon them. In 1978, there was $6.4 billion invested in these money market mutual funds. In 1979, it was $33.4 billion. In 1980, $61.4 billion. In 1981, $150.9 billion. And in 1982, $182.2 billion. The force of the explosion of these money market mutual funds started the process of breaking down the whole structure of Federal Reserve control over interest rates and laid the foundations for the deregulation of the financial markets which we are now seeing uh, spreading uh, like wildfire. Once the money market mutual fund steamroller got going, it was clear that the days of Federal Reserve controls over interest rates were ending. This in turn laid the foundations for what I've called the revolt of the financial markets. Since 1981, we have seen unprecedented real interest rates in the United States. In 1981, I think we had something like a 12% rate on a 30-year US bond, and we had something like 10%, uh, 9 or 10% inflation. In 1983, we've still got nearly a 12% nominal yield on a 30-year US bond, and we've got 3 or 4% inflation. The financial markets have revolted and you, you can almost hear the participants in the financial markets of this country saying, never again. Well, well that will rem remain to be seen <clears throat> how many years will pass before they have the wool pulled over their eyes again. But in any case, for the moment, the money illusion has completely disappeared to be replaced by deep-seated suspicion and scepticism in the financial markets. This revolt of the financial markets is a powerful deterrent to the use of Federal Reserve power. This was clearly shown during 1982-83, the most recent example and the most vivid example that I can think of of the revolt of the financial markets in action. Beginning in July 1983, the Federal Reserve began a major expansionary uh, monetary policy, which led to a rise in uh, money M1 of about 13% between July 82 and June 1983. The initial reaction of the uh, financial markets to that uh, big, very big input of liquid funds by the Federal Reserve beginning in July was to uh, rise bond futures and uh, therefore 
uh, drop uh, interest rates quite sharply. Um, and between July and October of 1982, bond futures rose quite sharply. But by October of 92, it was all over. And in October of 1983, bond futures are no higher than what they were in October of 1982. The period during which the financial markets were prepared to go along with an expansionary policy of the Federal Reserve was very short. In this case, it was three months as far as the bond futures markets were concerned. I think that is a very encouraging development as the effect of that was to limit the extent to which the Federal Reserve could continue to pursue that expansionary policy. The policy continued until about April of 1983 when uh, all growth in uh, banks reserves ceased. Uh, but by that time, um, interest rates had started to rise and it was quite obvious that the financial markets were not going to countenance a continuation of the expansionary Federal Reserve policy at the nominal interest rates that applied when that policy was initiated. I can think of no more remarkable example of the success of free markets in holding inflation and in frustrating the intentions of an irresponsible central bank and the experience of the revolt of the financial markets in the United States in the last three years. Admittedly, it is not a very strong basis on which to base one's hopes of stable money and of a limit on the proclivities of politicians. But it is the best thing that we have got at the moment. Subsequent deregulation of the financial markets in the United States has reinforced the process of liberation, making it more difficult for the Federal Reserve to repeat its disastrous policies of the 1970s. That damage, the damage that has resulted from the experience of the last 15 years is of course enormous. The capital structure of the United States has been eroded, savings have been reduced and those that have been made have been wasted, unemployment has been raised to extreme levels, the prospect of economic growth for the United States is very limited, due to the shortage of savings and the reluctance of the financial markets to permit any reduction in real interest rates. And I'd just like to conclude by making a, a little uh, couple of points about our current situation. As of now, after one year of economic recovery, the United States real gross national product is about 6% greater than what it was in 1978. Between 1968 and 1978, real US gross national product rose about 50%. Since 1978, it's risen about 6%. This country is stuck. What are the prospects of uh, further expansion? The Federal Reserve has initiated a policy of monetary restriction since last June, which I believe will bring about an end to economic expansion in 1984 uh, and possibly leading into 1985. So I can imagine the situation where in 1985 the real gross national product of the United States might be 10% greater than what it was in 1978. As far as the rest of the world is concerned, Latin America is in such a state of uh, economic uh, uh, confusion and uh, destruction that it will take several years for that group of nations to get back to where they were in about 1980. As far as Western Europe is concerned, while the United States real GNP between fourth quarter 82 and fourth quarter 83 might go up by 6%, in Western Europe it's gone up by about 2%. The, during the period of the age of inflation, I remember I had lunch with Rupert Murdoch 
at dinner with Rupert Murdoch in 1978 while this was going on. And uh, Rupert said to me, well, you know, what, what, sort of what's going to happen after all, all this? And I said, I think it would be wrong to believe that you're going to be able to get out of a mess, a disaster of these proportions without a very long period of pain. Well, so far there's been five years of negligible economic growth in this country, the longest period of negligible economic growth for 50 years. And that negligible economic growth is quite likely going to persist for another couple of years while the economic and financial system of this country uh, tries to readjust to the disaster that has occurred. Thank you.